On February 24th, 1971, this 446 Barracuda was born. On July 5th, 1981, it was raced, wrecked, and left for dead. The pre-paint work is done on this car. We're assembling the panels for fit. It will then be ready for its final paint and assembly. This is Graveyard Cars. On this episode of Graveyard Cars, Work continues on our 1969 Hemi Roadrunner convertible. Mark and Mike build out the suspension for the 1971 Challenger RT, equipped with a rare formal roof option, and the team begins the task of converting a 70 Roadrunner into a Superbird tribute. They're coming to get you, Barbara. It has been established that the unburied dead are coming back to life. I'm Mark Warman. And together, we bring dead muscle cars back to life. To exactly the way they were on the day they were born. So this station will remain on the air day and night, day and night. With the pre-paint cured on the CUDA, Mark and Will begin to install the sheet metal and perform the final panel alignment. I think this is a good start right here. Normally I put these on by myself. I'm sure that you do. Pretty strong fella, ain't you? All right. Okay. Dear God. Well, there's no dear God. I need you to open up a little bit and come in a little, okay. Okay, open it up a little more, please. I don't know what you're doing. I just, uh, this is kind of like a no type day. He's grouchy, I don't know what the hell has happened. Yeah, cross shredding. I shouldn't be doing this right now. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot going on, and I'm a 100 mile an hour nightmare, all right? I never look back. I, I'm always Mach 2 with my hair on fire, okay? Sorry if I can't be subtle at times, but definitely, definitely not in a bad mood. Happy. Happier than a pig is. Close it a little. It's always a pleasure having Mark out here working with us. Heard through the grapevine that. Uh, I don't need to be out here. I think it's just taken out of context. Are you glad to have Mark out here helping in the shop? Context. No, I prefer if he didn't come out, unquote. What part of the context did I get lost in? I, I was just getting at the point that sure. you've built such a good team, you're not needed as much ah, out gotcha. here. I got gotcha, you, I got gotcha. you. So it was more like a compliment to you. So we need to pull it out a little bit. Sweet God. The Lord's name in vain, machine keeps rolling all over the floor, and that makes me want to strike somebody. Meanwhile, Dave Ray is assembling and installing various components on the 1969 Hemi Roadrunner convertible. We got a whole pallet of parts in from our vendors, just beautiful parts for this 1969 Roadrunner convertible 426 Hemi automatic. I love it when all these parts come in, I get all these beautiful parts. I got a brand new grill. I got my fuel lines, my brake lines. It's like Christmas time here at uh, Graveyard Cars. While these parts trickle in, I just keep putting them on the car. Those parts get uh, detailed and we just move forward and uh, it's, it's a really quick process. Next thing you know, you got a car that's driving down the road. Recently on our Hemi Roadrunner convertible, Will duplicated the appearance of the N96 air grabber option to OE perfection. Then Alyssa and Dave installed it just in time for Mark and the Ghouls to reunite the Roadrunner with its legendary powertrain. First thing I'll be doing is uh, the undercarriage. Uh, I'll get all the torsion bars in and my drive line in, but before I do that, I like to put all my fuel lines in. Uh, and this particular car has a fuel and a vent line, so I gotta run both of those down the frame rail, uh, get all the rest of my frame uh, brake lines in, parking brake cables and stuff like that. So I like to get the fuel tank and all that there in. So I just kind of work from the bottom up, and uh, then I'll start building out my firewall, get all the rest of the engine compartment done, and then uh, work on the interior. Uh, convertible top and everything's all uh, in place and functioning, so uh, we get Larry in here to put a top on it, and everything else will go uh, pretty smooth after that. the old guy that used to work here? I called him Chips? No. Well, no, but you saw the show. Oh, I was coaching my kids at sports. Oh, oh that's right. You need to be called coach. I forgot about that. No, I never watched the show, so I'm sorry. You, got, you guys know the guy, right? He's got to be called coach. No, it's hey, not. Hey, coach. It's not the guy. You want me to call you boss? 
I don't want you to call me boss. Yeah, you do. I never wanted you You've to call all, me boss. Yeah, you I've exactly never asked I'm you to call me boss. About. I want to be called boss. I never said any such thing. You're a liar and a fat mouth. He said one thing that was very important to him is he was recognized as the boss. Kind of instructed everyone to go through it was either boss or he did like sir back in the day, but we went with boss since. I know my truth. Oh yeah, that's, that's you. You're golden that way. Yeah, we need some shims. Coach, coach. Has to be called coach. Whatever you say, boss. All right. See, he loves it. I never asked anybody to call me boss. I have a lot of employees that just, hey, boss, I think it's a term of endearment. Everyone here calls him boss. That's just what he likes to hear. I think Suzanne calls him boss. He makes his children call him coach when they're not on the playing field. You, you see what I'm getting at, Harold? They call me dad. All six of them look at me, they all call me dad. They'll go home, they'll watch this, and it'll be coach from this point forward, all because of his stupidity. Mark decides to check in with Dave while he preps to install the Red Streak Firestone tires on the 1969 Hemi Roadrunner convertible. So our drivetrain's installed in our 1969 one of one Plymouth Roadrunner 426 Hemi convertibles in what color? Q5, seafoam tur turquoise, right? Turquoise, that's yeah. right. Now what's cool about this is this gets the painted wheels. So it has the, I think the 15-6 painted wheel, painted the body color, uses the poverty hubcaps on it and originally would have been a red streak tire. I think that that's one of the neatest combinations, especially when you're talking about a turquoise car with turquoise wheels. Yeah. Instead of the Goodyear's, I went with the Firestones. And the main reason why, this car was built in the same period as a lot of the Daytonas were, and those all had the Firestone red streaks on it. And so I just thought it'd be a nice homage to the original red streak tires that would have came in that period of time for whatever unbeknownst reason, that's what's crazy. Nobody knows why the Daytona showed up with them, but other cars besides the Daytonas in that time period, in that late spring of 69, started showing up with these uh, Firestone red streaks. So I thought it'd be a cool touch. And that is cool. Whether yeah. it's right or wrong, good or bad, I still think it's a cool thing, yeah. so. They look the same, it's just a different brand. Yeah, that'd be sweet. Uh, so with that, basically, I'd green light you guys go ahead and put the tires on, get them mounted up, balance them, put the weights on the inside, and I can't wait to see it done. It's gonna look awesome. Cool. High five from numero right. uno, and roll. For Dave and Mike, mounting a new tire is fairly simple. They lubricate both beads, install the lower bead, install the upper bead, set the beads with air pressure, and then inflate to the proper PSI. All right, down to putting the last fender on here, coach. <laughs> okay, we're not doing that, It coach. just never gets old. All right. For what? Sweet okay, back. What are you doing? I'm trying to still align the stud there. <laughs> Why you always got to cuss? That's one of the things I've wondered about you lately. You're a cusser. You've gone crazy on the cussing. What's happening there? I apologize, boss. <laughs> it's okay, coach. With all the pre-paint done on the CUDA, we were able to hang the doors and the fenders, uh, do the rest of the panel alignment. Now, at this point, there's lots of just a millimeter here twist or a little millimeter there. Sometimes you have to sand the edge of a door to get some of the material off it so you have the right lines. So that's all the stuff I usually do when I kick everybody out of here. It's kind of like my graphics. I don't want anybody bugging me. But basically, everything's on the car. Um, coach and I did a phenomenal job. Him being out here is just not working. Uh, now it's going to be coach for the next six months. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play today. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play. You, you, you see what I'm saying? I, I, I just can't do it. This isn't working. Oh, it, he's gone. With the panels and doors aligned, Dave and Mike finished mounting the tires for the 1969 Hemi Roadrunner convertible. Well, we're going off the rim size with this right here. You gotta input this into the machine. So if you look on the meter right there, it's showing a six inch yeah. rim. That's right here. Yep. Hit on that, we got a six inch on that. And then this right here will measure. And the inner and you go in the same spot on that, right Mike? Right here. Almost about nine. nine and a half, huh? Tire size is a 15. Is a 15 inch, so we're good to go there. 
It's kind of nice having these computerized jobbers. You just input the stuff and it figures it all out for you. And we're static balancing, so there's no weights on the outside. Yep. You're gonna put the lead weights on the inside, the stick-on weights? Yep, do the stick-on so the outside of the rim will look nice and clean. Originally, they were a clip-on lead weight that would go on the outside of the wheel, but that's unsightly. And if you are gonna put them on there and you want to be right, you would need NOS ones. Those are a fortune and they're impossible to find. This, this line will tell you right when the, the wheel's lined up to yep. put the weight. Yeah, as soon as it hits on the top there, you just put it right at 12 o'clock and spin her away again there. Here's the thing about the name calling. Certainly every kid that ever went to school went through that on the playground, you know, poo-poo head. And <laughs> uh, my first experience with name calling as an adult probably is my Uncle Wayne. Um, he's a hater. He was an original hater. Um, like, you know, if he called me uh, Brown Pool or something like that, I always thought he was just giving me a compliment, kind of like Buddy or Pal, something like that. Some of the names that I use even today, you know, like Almond Roken and stuff like that, that was stuff he taught us as, when we were in our formative years. Hey boss, did you get that email? Boss? Really? Oh, well. Been talking to him, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Pick your sides well. Okay. You'd be wise to. You're okay. the boss too. Thanks for coming in today, Dad. I just want to talk to you about the um, human resources job that you put me in charge of and the meeting. Do you want to come sit a little closer or? No, that's good. This is fine. I like this. It's a very corporate feeling. So basically my dad's put me in charge of human resources. So he started out by sending me to a seminar to kind of like get me acclimated with some of the things that I might be dealing with. Something that I'm, I'm really worried about is name calling. Name calling. Nicknames? Making fun of people? Well, any calling anybody by that's something fun. Their that's fun. That's an endearing thing. That's love. That's my way of sharing that I like <clears throat> somebody. If I just walk by, past somebody and say, hey, Bill, hey, Fred, I don't like them. No, I'm that's a nice know. thing to say. Good morning, Mike. Good. Hi, Will. How are you doing today? It's not funny. Reeling it back. Right now we're talking about harassment. Okay. One of the number one things that falls sure. under harassment, name calling. Like, you're not everybody's dad. You're my dad. You know, that might be endearing to me to call me a lamb fry, which it's not. Learn something, you've learned it, and your advice to me is starting next week? No, like, the sooner the better. Okay. People are going to be able to make these complaints? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's unfortunate. We have an application. They'll be able to pick up in the office from Vonda. So, meeting adjourned. Adjourned. Right now, the guys over in the metal shop are getting ready to do all of the metal, internal metal work and external metal work on our 1970 Plymouth Superbird tribute car. The ghouls have been hired to convert a 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner into a Superbird tribute car. While an original Superbird is based on the Roadrunner body, significant changes had to be made, such as the use of a coronet hood and fenders, an aerodynamic nose cone, flush mount headlights and backlight, and of course, the famous NASCAR-inspired adjustable rear wing. To make the transformation successful, the team will put their skills to the test by utilizing a donor 1970 Roadrunner body. Additionally, our top vendors will be called on to help, and specialized Superbird parts from winged warrior body parts will be a necessity. Tony, back at Tony's Parts, helped us out a lot because what he ended up having was a 1970 Roadrunner, a real-life RM23 car. Problem with it was, it was getting picked apart, it was left for dead. It was really, for a 383 Roadrunner, it would not have been worth putting back together again. But as this tribute car, it's perfect. So Tony and I made a deal, got the car out here. The car was just in dire straits. We literally have cut off the entire front end because everything on it was rotten, except for the tie bar, which will have the correct numbers in it. Uh, one of the coolest things that we've done here at Graveyard Cars, we borrowed a branch from our friends over at Auto Metal Direct's installation center, Craig back there. How it works is these pegs go into predetermined holes in the actual unibody of the car, starting at the very front of the car, working your way to the back. We took those specs, we took those measurements, and we built a jig. This is great to be able to do this cut it apart, blow it apart, clean everything up, and know that when we're done putting sheet metal in it, the car's perfectly square. So what we're gonna do now, we're gonna flip this over, move it into the car, fantastic. A Little bit more your way. Yeah. 
has from here, you see by me lifting up on the back of it here, he's going to fit the front to the firewall pinch weld. These two get welded together, this one and this one. When he marries these two together, then all these holes are going to line up with the frame rails that are underneath it for the torsion bar cross member and the front frame rail. These obviously line up already with the rockers. So he is going to screw this down so everything's tight against the metal before he begins welding. Then he's able to weld the whole thing in place. After that, he's going to slip in the two step wells. Once that's done, the center section of the car is completely welded up and we can move to the front or to the back. George, you got my green light. Hopefully we got it this time. Yep. Awesome. All right. Let's get these babies on there, right? Boy, these look awesome. Cool. Oh, these, these look amazing. And if we get those dog dish hubcaps on there, say Plymouth Division on them, that's eh, going to look cool. Yeah, it's nice to have uh, original stuff like that. Right now, Dave and I are getting ready to do the final touches on our 71 Cuda Tribute car. This Winchester Gray, 1971, 446 barrel, four speed, Shaker Hood Tribute Cuda is in its last stages at Graveyard Cars. Beginning life as a 318 automatic, the ghouls were commissioned to perform just the exterior restoration. The owner is excited to get the vehicle back and perform the final assembly. Then this rare fish can swim the streets. So fast forward to where we are, we're getting ready to install the rear window louvers, the rear spoiler, and then I still have one side of the fish gills left to put on it. Yeah, instructions are really straightforward. I mean, they tell you to find center. Go in between your uh, package tray there. Then once you find center, you measure, I think, 10 inches on each side. So you got 20 spread. Put in your clips in there. Gotcha. Of these pins, and then you set your, uh, your louvers right in these bottom sets. And then as soon as it flips down, you just mark your upper holes, and it's a done deal. So I'm gonna yeah, we got swap it around there. there. Yep. Okay. And you got a pin there. Let me grab mine. I got a pin. Yep. More in that range. And I'll go from the outside in just for fun, I guess. Okay. That's okay just for like now. That. Beautiful. Look at that. Then yeah, we flip and these up. Line we'll up get gorgeous. our gorgeous. Look at that. Little rubber. Here's the original pad. This is the original gasket that goes underneath there. It's a done deal. All right, let's put some screws in it. Yep. We've right. got our rear louvers on. Everything's buttoned down, fitting the way it's supposed to. They look awesome. That looks beautiful. We're going to put our Dale Cuda rear spoiler on. In 1970, the spoiler that was available on the Mopar muscle cars was called a GO, G-O, space wing, GO wing. In 71, the Mopar muscle cars, while it looked similar, it was shaped a little bit differently, and it was called a gull, like a seagull wing. This is a 71, so it gets the gull wing. The main difference is on a gull wing, the ends don't tip down. They just come back like a, almost like a boomerang on both ends a little bit, but it's mostly level. On a go wing in 70, they tip down and back. So it's a subtle difference, but it's very noticeable if you're looking. All right. The way these go in their pecking order is the spoiler goes on first. Nice. Very nice. Then we open and hold the spoiler. I can hold you the spoiler? Hold it? Yeah. I'll grab some hardware. These are a really slick. These color. are a really unique little setup. Again, when you get your right spoiler from the right people, like Dale's, it comes with the right hardware. This is not just a nut, it's obviously a very unique nut. See how this threads up and down? That's going to set the depth. This little nut is going to come out past an extra nut that's going to go onto a bracket. And what that's going to allow me to do is by pushing it in or backing it off is going to make the spoiler 
go high or low into the deck lid. What we want is to be a perfect match. We don't want it to suck the deck lid down so it has a sinkhole in it, and we don't want it to raise it up. And let's close it to where it'll set, and yeah, what do you think? Uh, the spoiler and the louvers, uh, really easy to put on. I mean, a must for anybody that, that wants to do it themselves, no problem. I say we put it right there. Right there again? You got my blessing. All right. Okay, all we have left is the fender gills. We get all of our uh, fender gills and a lot of other parts from our friend Tony at Tony's Parts. Heck yeah. These are butamous. Take a yeah. real nice look at this. Awesomeness. You have your argent silver on the infield, your matte black. A lot of these out there have those features, but they're the wrong colors. They also don't have this outer lip that you see here that has a black. Most always, when Chrysler had chrome in an emblem or a nameplate, they had what they called a shadow. Their emblems have them where the face is shiny, but the sides are black. This is the way they're supposed to be from the factory. This is such a beautiful touch, such a oh, beautiful it is. touch. The 71 Good. billboards and gills, just the ultimate. Outrageous. That's what I love about them. So you heard all the, all the craziness about the nicknames, right? See, when I was working at a dealership, I mean, they called me Welby, you know, they, they called me the kid, you know, one yeah. of them called me Iceman stuff. And the nicknames Mark does is, it's it's funny. I mean, you gotta kind of laugh. Mark's just a funny guy, and that's just the way he is. So really, we're done with the car, at least as far as we're supposed to go on it. It's beautiful. We put that uh, awesome looking rear window louver on there, the gold wing. Gold wing's totally cool. The front gills on there with the billboards, Winchester gray. Shaker hood, six pack, four speed, pfft, doesn't get any more iconic than that. I mean, that's just, it's just one bad CUDA. So there's a lot of nomenclature on these cars. Um, what does that mean? Basically verbiage, uh, there's a lot of verbiage. There's a lot of numbers, there's a lot of alpha codes. There's a lot of things that make up the engine besides it just having a stamp that says it's the VIN number. So if I show you an engine, it's got the VIN number on it, you're gonna go, yeah, that matches the car. Well, does it? Let's just be sure, because there's things that you need to know when the engine was assembled, what's the scheduled production okay. date of the car? Those are the things I wanna spend time going got over it. with her. So what I wanna show you is what to look for on an engine to validate that it is or is not the original engine the car started life with. This engine is supposed to be the original numbers matching engine to a 70 Roadrunner 440 six barrel four speed track pack car. Look at that number, that first set of numbers F. that's on there. It's an F 440 HP. And what's the HP stand for? High performance. Okay. What year does the F represent? 70? Yeah. Because A would be 65, B would be 66, so on up. This engine is designed to be in a 1970 model car, and the Roadrunner we're talking about is a 1970. See, we got all the B bodies lined up, 71, and then it descends in order, sorry, it goes downhill in order all the way back over there, and we got A's and B's and C bodies all put together. Nice. You ever just wish sometimes you could unzip your head and just yard your brain out and put mine in there? No. Okay, what's the VIN number in Which one are you the window? RN23V0A162599. Okay. So we just need the last. How's that match against the one that's on the engine? It matches. This is one of the inspectors stamped his initial on there, P, means he's signed off on this. That's what that P stands for. This is a very original tag. They built the engine a week before the car was ready to go. So they, they didn't have one sitting on the shelf for a month. They, had, they knew this car and many others like it were coming down the line, so they said, we got some uh, B11 cars coming up, we need some engines, so they started putting them together. So this makes sense, the VIN makes sense, the tag's original, the dash VIN's original, that is a numbers matching, Mark Warman guaranteed numbers matching engine setup. Now are you sure when I was talking about ripping your head open, plucking oh that brain gosh. of yours out and putting mine in there, that's not an option. Absolutely You saw the not. man with two brains, Steve Martin? Nope. He loved the lady's body, so he, so he, he wanted to kill her and he yard her brain out and put movies, the other Dad. lady's brain in it because that way he could was have that some. Made, like, how old was I? Was I even born yet? But it turns out she was a bitch. Have you watched any new movies this year? More intricate, 11-4. Yeah. You know what that means? The month. The 11th month, the fourth day. So we would have to assume 
that the scheduled production date of the car was November 4th of 1969 or later. The engine could have been put together weeks before the car, but it can never be put together after the car is built. That wouldn't make sense. You can't go back in time. The same morning would fly, right? Yeah. So 11-4. So we know that that's the scheduled production date. So right there, you'll see it was cast on this date. I gave them all the way from 722 to 69 to get this block ready to go in the car. So there's your basic 101. You should be able to walk up and say, do I need to look further based on that pad? Because if that number precedes that scheduled production date of the car, either by the day it was built or if it's close enough that you have to check the VIN down on the bottom. Which engine are you gonna put in this guy's car? Which one would you put in there? That one. Why? Because it's the original. These days, everything's on the fast track at graveyard cars. So for example, our 71 Challenger Sassy Grass car that just recently got disassembled has already gone through body and is getting its pre-paint on it. The suspension behind me is what we're getting ready to assemble today. It's for that car. Okay, so one of the things that we're doing now that we didn't used to do was when it comes to building our front end kits, we're just calling PST, Performance Suspension Technologies. And the reason for it is because they make the entire kit. The whole thing comes in one. I don't have to call the parts store and say I need, for example, upper control arm bumper stops. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna install the upper ball joints into the upper control arm bushings. That's this little jewel here. We'll run these two in. We'll put the cups on them. Once we're done with that, we'll go over to the lower control arms and we start putting those control arm bushings in and we'll build this thing out. We're gonna put the lower control arms in first. Okay. Go ahead and slide your other side in there. Put that shaft in the hole. God, that was just hilarious. Well, it wasn't meant to be hilarious. It was mildly, he's laughing. You got drum brakes in the back of these cars, always did, all the cars did. And they didn't come up with rear disc brakes until the mid 70s on certain models. This is drum brake, but it's also drum on the front. So I don't know if you've ever stopped one of these. If they're the good heavy duty drums like the 71 Challenger 383 has, they will work right if they're set up right. How are we doing? Good, come have a seat. I have a couple of things I wanna to talk to you about. Okay. Well, my worst nightmare happened. So basically I have all these complaints here. Are for you. Well, why'd you give them the forms? I told you when we opened well, up the resources. Do you go out and just so anyways, okay. walked into assembly shop, said hello to Mark in a friendly manner, and he said that I look like the dude from the Mucinex commercial. In fairness, that's, that's not a... funny at all. That is so rude. This is harassment. That is not harassment. Is that harassment. is endearing words of endearment. And That's... then, even worse, down here we have a question saying who witnessed this. He said pretty much everyone on staff. Yeah. It's, it's, Dad. That's the stage down there. No, that is a body shop. What we can't, okay. we can't. After greeting me and appraising my work, Mark suggested I needed to do cleaner work on the cars and that I needed to lay off the calories since I was a blubber. Yeah, that's blub. Okay. He needs to lose some weight or he's gonna have a damned heart attack. I don't wanna be that guy at his funeral saying I should have said something to my friend. Mark repeatedly calls me Beaker, like Beaker from oh. the Muppets. He thinks I look like a Muppet. So what? I'm sick of being called Beaker. That's the camera guy right now. The dude looks like Beaker. It, me, 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 me. It's not okay. This is People are upset. You're harassing I them. I have a, a lot of other work to do out there that I don't need to be sorting through these. I agree. I'm having to call you in and have meetings. I agree completely. I waste both of our time. I don't want to have to have get these anymore. Who's done them? Got a special place? Get rid of that. First. I actually need those. <laughs> Stupid. As you were. Thanks. Yep. We're all in trouble. Finished with his meeting, Mark returns to help Mike finish the suspension for the 1971 Challenger. 
We've got the whole suspension built out, except for a couple of things. Right now we're waiting for the steering gear to come back from firm feel. We send all of our power steering and manual gears out to them. They go through and rebuild them, rebush them, reseal them. The rest of it's ready to go. Our backing plates are on for our drums. This is the heavy duty 11 inch drum setup that I was talking about. Now that we have it all together, everything except again, our steering gear is the only thing we're missing. We'll go ahead and move it over to the assembly stand. That complete drivetrain then will be ready to marry together with our FJ671 Challenger RT383 formal roof car. Today I'm rounding up most of the crew. I got Alyssa and Mike and Dave help me put together this 440 engine that we've got. Now, this is kind of exciting. They don't even know what this engine's for. But as we go along with the build, I'll kind of give them some hints and some clues. Uh, they probably wouldn't be able to guess in a million years otherwise, but it's something I've wanted to do. Uh, we're hoping it goes smoothly. Uh. Yeah, we should just be able to bolt together. Right? Yeah, yeah, as long as all our parts and pieces are, are correct and we have them all, you know, all our bolts mainly. We can rock and roll. Rock and roll. So let's take our main caps off. Listen, remember the engine you took apart? Yeah. With the main caps? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay, each one of these has a number on it. So number one, two, three, four, and five. Okay. And it always starts at the front of the engine. Alyssa and I have been talking and, and working on engines and codes here recently, and I thought this would be a great opportunity for her to get her hands dirty and work on the engine, see how the rings go on the piston, see what a good looking bottom end is, not, not sexual, the a bottom end to the car, you know, like the main bearings and the rod bearings and stuff like that, compared to the one like we tore apart recently. So what's the first step? Like, what are we doing right now? Right now they're putting in the bearings, the main bearings. If you okay. look, there's a hole right there. Mm -hmm. Oil comes through that hole. If you don't have that hole lined up with the bearing, you won't have oil pressure and oil circulating through that galley. The next thing they're gonna do is set the crankshaft down in there. Then they'll put the main caps on. We'll put grease on it as well. After that, we can put the rear main seal in it. Once that's done, we'll start assembling this pistons and rods into place. Okay. All right. So they're green light go now. Did you get all that? Did you grasp it? Yep. <laughs> Now we're ready to put in uh, pistons and rods. They're all connected together, all right? So he's gonna start with the number one and work his way to the back. And now we're gonna put in the pistons? And now he's gonna put in these beautiful new hyper yeah. pistons. And they're not, uh, what was that, Mike? This is right, right? It's four and eight, the four. These are the same type of pistons that were in it originally? What kind of car is this for? Anyways. Uh, yeah, that is a good question. I know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <laughs> so it could be a number of cars out here. We got so many to take a 440. HP motors. It's a great question, and I'm unfortunately I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. But we're still excited about doing it. Yeah. It's Are you really fun. not going to tell us what cards we're to, working like on? I'm guess, though. Well, what? Well, let's worry about that in a little bit. I'll give you some clues. All right. You yeah. All right. Here you go. You can do this part. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I'm going to so dunk them here, and then we'll put these on dunk afterwards. He's going to When you put this on, mm -hmm. and it says bottom, so that goes towards the engine. Okay. Got your first clue. First clue. Okay. What was the first clue? I'm, I'm getting ready to give it to you. Oh, okay. All right. So I'll try this. This goes towards the bottom of the. Okay. And squeeze it tight. Pull yeah. up. That's and right. See those springs pushing back out is what creates your compression inside mm -hmm. of that cylinder. Mini bike. Mini bike. Mini so bike. Open it up. There you go. Yeah. Outside of the fact that it's obviously for a cool cause and a cool project, uh, it's also going to be a very educational thing for Alyssa to be working on. Um, so it's exciting how they go together, what they're supposed to look like when they're done right, compared to the stuff that she's taken apart with me in the past that wasn't so good. Honda 350. Honda 350. So we got Honda 350. Mini bike. Mini bike, right? I have no idea. Okay, okay, okay. Another clue. Oh, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna make, the, go. I'm gonna make them easier now. Okay. Jaguar. X-K-E. Mm-hmm. This last one's gonna be the one that gives it, I think. Whites, perks, binnies, ups, poppers. Oh. I know what that is. This last one's gonna be the one that gives it, I think. Whites, perks, binnies, ups, poppers. Oh. I know what that is. San Francisco. Yep. Denver. To Denver. Go. Vanishing Point. This engine is for our Vanishing Point tribute car. We are building a 1970 original Challenger Alpine White, that's EW1, 444 barrel, four speed tribute cars to the original one that they only made 916 of. 
Mark has been commissioned to build the iconic 1970 Challenger RT 440 Magnum from the 1971 American action movie Vanishing Point. With the engine nearly built out, the next step is to get it installed on the run stand with the goal of firing it up. That's a wrap. Let's roll it over and put some heads on. Mark checks in on the bodywork on the Superbird Tribute Project. With the help of the frame jig, the rear and front frame rails are welded into place to precise OE measurement. All that is left is a quick QC before work continues. So what he's doing right now is he's just putting a tack to hold things in place. So that while that's held in place, he can put his gussets where he wants, take his time, not worry about that moving around at all. Notice we're doing the exact same thing on the front that we did on the back, except that with the front, looking here, we don't have this panel open like we did in the back. The back is a C-channel frame rail. This is a boxed frame rail. These are designed when this slides into position over that, but like that, up against the frame rail. That's what he has going over there right now. He has a small gap between the rear existing frame rail and the new front one. This is gonna be for welding. He has a clamp to hold everything in position. Hit it, BCG. Curious, George. With George, we're getting to a point where he's doing such a phenomenal job Look at, the, look at the factory spot welds. He uses our AIM spot welder, but take a look at that. That's exactly that depth, that reach, that pattern. All of that emulates the original look. He's done a phenomenal job. This is beautiful. And what's nice, it's on the frame jig. We know it's square. With the Superbird Tribute frame welded into place, Mark can finish building out the 440 Magnum for the Vanishing Point 70 Challenger RT. We lost one of our ghouls. Uh, Alyssa had to do some HR stuff upstairs, which probably means go touch her makeup up. Anyway, she's not gonna be here for that, but it's not gonna take us long. Uh, I'll drag her back down once we get ready to fire it up. I do not believe there's a high and low to these critters. Other than top, that's it. That one should go there. I'm kind of holding your bottom here, so. Yep, there you go. Cutter, I'm gonna yep, get I'm gonna my glove out of there. I'm gonna grab a bolt or two. Yeah. And I don't like that, Dave, when you tell me you're holding my bottom. Yep. Well, I dip mine in oil. Do you want to dip sure, yours in oil? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I like to dip them in oil. <laughs> I'm not in here. Just... So there you go. That's where that one goes. They'll torque it down. The spark plug wires, as they come off of this, will come down, wind through here, and go back and feed the other spark plug wires. Try to get this on. As soon as Mr. Dave gives me the word, I'll get the other valve cover ready. With the engine nearly finished, it's time to get it loaded on the engine run stand and plumbed for its first ignition. So we have our 440 for the Vanishing Point Challenger completely assembled. So right now, we're ready to fire it up. I'm rounding the everybody up, including Alyssa. And of course, you'll notice in the background that my friend Q-Ball Morton's back there. The original nipples, that's what we used to call them. What do you think, ready? Yeah, I'm ready, I wanna hear it. Stop me up, Mick Jagger used to sing. Mickey, you do, you do, do the honors. Do the, I'm, I'm introducing <laughs> you, that's. Oh, got a little something going on. Oh, look at that. Mick Jagger. Oh, Mark's dancing is Mark's dancing. I mean, he gets a kick out. He loves it. Every time a motor fires up, it's like his cue to, to turn on the, you know, the dance moves. So this time here was, a, of course, the Rolling Stones uh, start me up. You got to have Mark's dance, and that's, that's Mark. You know, when a motor starts, he's going to dance. That's just the way it goes. Our 440 fired right up. Uh, sounds beautiful. We have no leaks, no drips, no errors, so that's awesome. Again, the engine run stand takes all the guesswork out of it, all the potential having to take it back off later. That's beautiful.
Beautiful. That's like how we'll Beautiful job. I'm most excited about this engine because it's going, of course, in our Vanishing Point Kowalski car, which I've wanted <laughs> to do forever. So it was great nice. when a customer came along and said, I'll fund it, because it's, it's a perfect cool. world for me, yeah. <laughs> I get to do it. Oh, that sounds good. Sounds yeah, I like great. It. Just... Good response. So now with the engine running, we're gonna move it over to one of the uh, K members and start building out the suspension for it. Uh, get the transmission in here. We're putting a six speed in it uh, with an overdrive. Uh, get it all built out. Meanwhile, the Challenger has already been disassembled and we're getting ready to send it over to the dipper. As soon as it gets back, it's a beautiful body. It's gonna go really fast. We'll call Auto Metal Direct, get our fenders and our doors for it. That thing will go together like a breeze. Graveyard card, baby. History in reverse. Now he's looking for somebody to drive this car back from Denver to San Francisco in 15 hours. I'll do it. You'll do it, right? Some yep. ups, whites, bennies, perks, poppers, snappers, whatever they're called. What did they say? Spills and thrills and a yeah, handful of pills? Yeah, and the problem is, is you're too old for that. So what you'd have to have is a bunch of mochas. And since you're lactose intolerant, you'll be crapping your pants the entire way. No, they have almond milk now. Did not know that. Now that the 440 Magnum is running, it's time to load up the completed 1971 Winchester Gray Tribute Cuda to be delivered to its eager owner. Uh, the gentleman lives up in Portland, just outside of Portland, so we're going to deliver it to him in our Trailers Plus trailer. I mean, I hate to see these cars go. I mean, they're awesome to look at every day. Uh, when one goes, uh, another one comes in, so it's, it's always nice to see one go because I'll have something else coming in. With the Winchester Gray Tribute Cuda on its way home, the ghouls reflect on their week. Dave continued the assembly on the 1969 Hemi Roadrunner convertible. Mark and Mike built out the suspension to the 1971 Challenger RT. Mark revealed that the team has been commissioned to make the legendary 1970 Challenger RT 440 Magnum from Vanishing Point, and the team began the task of converting a 70 Roadrunner into a Superbird tribute. Mr. D? We're busting. We're working on, buddy. I think putting Alyssa in charge of human resources was the right answer, no question about it. Being HR manager this week was a huge waste of my time. I just want to thank you. You do awesome work for me. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Sending her to Portland, the seminars has proven to be very informational as well. Driving to Portland for the conference was a waste of my time. Pulling my dad in here to talk to him about it was a waste of my time. Doing a good job, buddy. Uh, the message about the nicknames and the name calling, message received loud and clear. The only thing about that is you gotta keep in mind I'm the boss and I have to take everything that I hear with a grain of salt. I have to take everything that somebody wants me to consider, digest it, use my gut level value system. That was Professor Morrissey Massey, University of Colorado, came out with the gut level value system years ago and make a decision. Billy! What's happening, boss? How much? What are you working on? Uh, getting all the gaps wrapped up on this. Nice. Looking nice. pretty good though. It's coming together nice. Listen, I'm sorry. For what? Ah, uh, the whole silly name calling. I got the messages. Liz is doing a good job. She kind of clued me in on how everybody feels about it. So uh, it's just just more. Part it never, of it. It never, it never meant any harm. You know, we're just having some fun. All right, bro. George is doing a good job, buddy. Thank you. Keep up good work. I've made that decision, and I'm moving forward. And I think we probably have what I consider to be a nice, even middle ground. Uh, see, he did it again. See, this is that <laughs> Did you get a name tag, George? Uh-oh, yep. Keep digging. His solution to calling people names was instead make them name tags and make it like an official. So I think that ultimately, uh, we've got a handle on this and we've made the right decision. I have no idea how that solves any problems. I mean, I feel like that just made it 10 times worse. You know, special filing cabinet. <laughs>